Hello, everyone. So um, I'm going to talk about mainly about how to define um, certain properties of commitments. And because of that, let me first introduce on a very high level to everyone what a commitment actually is. So what is the thing I'm talking about here? So for this, um, let's imagine a, a, a little toy application. The toy application is that I want to make a bet. For example, I, I know which horse will win the horse right, race, race tomorrow, and I want to bet a lot of money on it. But now the problem is if I just tell you which horse I think will win, Seems a bit if I know which horse will win and I just tell it to you, then you will bet on the same horse and so on, and this will, may lessen my um, winnings and so on. So I don't want to tell you which horse I'm betting on. But if I don't tell you and the next morning I just say, yeah, that was the horse I was betting on, then you're not going to pay me my, my bets because I could lie. So I need to be able to fix on a horse without you learning it. For example, in the physical world, we might use a um, sealed envelope for that. I put the name in an envelope, and we open it later when the race is over. But digitally, there are, there are other ways to achieve that. And, one, uh, and the way to achieve this is a so-called commitment. So you have two phases. In the first phase, the sender of the commitment, who has some message M, like the name of the horse, might do the following. He takes the message, appends some randomness to it, and then applies some hash function to the whole bunch and sends this to the recipient. And if we do things right, this will leak nothing about the message M. And later, after the race is over, the sender will do the open phase by just revealing what the horse name was and what the randomness was. And now the recipient can just check by hashing these two things and seeing whether that is actually um, the commitment that he was sent in the beginning. Now, this is just one particular way of doing a commitment. There are many different things you could send. But for simplicity, I will, in my talk, just always use this picture, um, because then you need to realize only one picture. But you should be aware that what I'm defining is for any kind of um, messages you could send here, as long as it's non-interactive. So, there are two properties that a commitment should have. The first is it should be hiding. So the recipient should, in the commit phase, not learn what M is. As we said, he shouldn't know which horse I'm betting on. And second, it should be binding. The sender should not be able to change his mind about which message M he is committing to. And uh, that corresponds to the fact that otherwise I could cheat in the bet. I, if, I would, if I could change my mind, I just wait until I know which horse wins, and then uh, say that's what I was betting on all along. So, um, and now the question is how do we define these two? The hiding property is quite easy to define. I'm not going to go into that, but basically it's just some indistinguishability, no matter which value I put here the quantum state that the recipient gets is, in this, uh, is close in trace distance, for example, or indistinguishable in some way. So that's known how to do it. Let's not think about it. The tricky part is the binding property. And I will talk today about how to define the binding property. And in order to show you why this is a non-trivial thing, let me show you first some definitions of binding that you could use. The first definition of binding, the simplest one, is perfectly binding. Since we don't want that the sender can change his mind about what is in there, basically we could require that this function is injected. Or more precisely, what we, uh, what we want is that there are no two different messages M uh, to which I can open it. So there are no M and M prime, such that the hash of M concatenated with some randomness equals the hash of M prime concatenated with another randomness. Because if this is the case, it means it's just impossible to open to a message of my choice. There can be only one. Now, this is a very good definition. It works very nicely in the quantum setting and in the classical setting, but it has one big disadvantage. 
Namely, if we want to use this definition, we are forced to use information theoretical security because there's nothing in here like the, the sender is computationally bind, uh, computation limited or something like this. In particular, we know that if we want to achieve this definition and at the same time we want to information theoretically hide the message, that is impossible, even if we use a quantum protocol and even more so if you, we want to use a classical protocol. So if we want to use the definition perfectly binding, then this will be incompatible if we want, for example, um, to long-term preserve the secrets that we do not open. So because of that, we would like a definition, an alternative, in the cases where we want information theoretical hiding, how do we define then the binding property? So let's try to do that. Let's define, uh, define the binding property in a computational sense. And on the slide before, well, let's go back for a moment, I said there's, there are no M and M prime such that this stuff hold. And now, I, the, if I'm talking about computationally limited adversaries, it should be sufficient to require that, well, there may be M and M prime to which we can both open them, but it shouldn't be possible to find them. That leads to the following definition. I call it computationally binding classical style because that's usually how it's defined in the classical setting. Um, so when we are, don't con are not considering quantum adversaries. And there it says it is computationally hard to find M not equal M prime and two different randomnesses so that the hash of M and the first randomness equals the hash of M and the second randomness. And the intuition is, that in this case, the adversary cannot find out how to open in two different ways. Yeah, he, there's, he doesn't know how to open the same commitment as M and as M, M prime. <coughs> so, does this help us now? Unfortunately not. Because we can show that even this, though this definition is very intuitive, and though this definition actually in the classical setting works very well, in the quantum setting, it behaves horribly. Um, imagine a commitment scheme where the following could happen. So that the sender commits by constructing some kind of fake hash value. Then someone te tells the sender some, say, random M. And then the sender opens this commitment to contain this message M. So he finds, after learning M, M and randomness, so that hash of M and randomness is the commitment C from above. Now, this should not happen. Imagine in the betting case, this is exactly what we wanted to be protected again. We did not want the adversary to open to whatever he learns even after commit committing. However, it turns out that we can, relative to some oracle, construct commitment schemes where this can happen but they are still computationally hiding in the classical sense. So this is perhaps quite surprising, um, but the reason is the classical definition forbids that the adversary can simultaneously know two openings, but it does not forbid that he can find one opening at a time while making it impossible to find the other one. Um, I'm not going to tell you how this works because that was a whole paper on its own, um, Fox 2014. We just improve on it a bit that it actually works with hash functions. So now we know the classical style binding is bad. What can we do instead? Well, a typical approach in the quantum setting is to use this definition here. So it says you take, fix some polynomial time um, adversary S, that's how some malicious sender, and then you look at the probability that this sender can open the commitment he um, produces as M equals zero, when he, where he gets M only after he has committed, and P1 is the probability that S opens as uh, the commitment as containing the message one, and now an adversary that totally breaks the commitment can get P1 plus P2 equals two, because he succeeds in opening to M0 and in opening to M1. An adversary 
with a perfect commitment will have the sum of these probabilities be equal one, or at most one. We could just fail. Um, so a computational adversary, we expect that the sum of these two probabilities, it has most one plus some negligible amount. Um, this definition, for example, has been used for the no-go theorems, I mean, without the word polynomial time. Unfortunately, this definition has also some drawbacks. I mean, it doesn't fail as cat uh, catastrophically like the classical binding, but it's not very satisfactory. That's the same, just in smaller. Um, one problem is the definition only works for single-bit messages. So, so the fact that the message is one bit long is hard-coded into the definition. We cannot talk about the binding property of multi-bit strings. And it is totally unclear with this definition, although it would be very interesting to find out, what happens if we commit to several messages at once? So if I commit to M1, M2, M3, are they all kind of together bound, or is only one individually of them bound at a time? We don't know. And the definition works very bad, or at least we don't know what to do with it, if we have proofs in which we have rewinding. Um, for those who don't know what rewinding is, I'm not going to explain it because it would sidetrack us, but it happens a lot in crypto, and with this definition, it's kind of unclear how to work with it. Then there are many more definitions, and for time reasons, I'm not going to tell you anything about them. Let me just mention that they all seem to have problems with rewinding. Actually, that was wrong. Uh, the UC definition doesn't, but the UC definition does a lot of overkill, so uh, they all have drawbacks. And now, without further ado, let me try to show you our new definition. And to go towards that definition, let us first think about the perfectly binding definition again. And let's try to formulate that definition in a totally new, very quantum-locking way. That's a bit surprising because we're talking about classical protocol against quantum adversaries, and now we do it very quantum. But let's see. So, perfectly binding. Look at the following game. We have an adversary. The adversary outputs some commitment, so a hash of message and randomness, uh, in theory. So that will be classical. But he also, on a quantum channel, outputs a message and a randomness. And here he can be in arbitrary superpositions. We only require him that the, if I would measure M and randomness, I would get a valid opening. But he can produce many valid openings in superposition. Now, perfect binding says there, is, can be, there can be only one such M. So perfect binding is equivalent to stating that in this game, this register here is not in a superposition, but in a collapsed classical state, uh, under the condition that they all match this C. Now let's change this game a bit more to get another equivalent definition. Now I put a measurement there. So I let him output that, and then I measure in the computational basis what this message is. Um, and now the fact that this is collapsed, in a, uh, that this is in a classical state, is equivalent to saying that this measurement in the computational basis has no effect on the state. Yeah? Because if it would be a superposition, it would affect the state. If it's not a superposition, it doesn't affect the state. So a new de definition of perfect binding. And now we make one more change. We say we measure, or we don't, according to some random bit B1, and then we put a second part of the adversary here who gets back this state and should guess whether we measured or not. And he can find that out if and only if we did, our measurement does change the state. So perfect binding is equivalent to saying that the adversary B cannot guess whether we measured, except with probability one half. So this is a new formulation of perfect binding, but not very useful on its own. But what we can do now, so this is the definition just restated uh, again, we can now define our definition, which we call collapse binding. Uh, and we do that by just weakening this to talk about polynomial adversaries. So the uh, scheme is collapse binding if and only if for any polynomial time algorithms A and B here, here and here, uh, B cannot guess the bit small b which tells us whether we measured with a probability that is better than one half plus something negligible. That is the whole definition, justified by analogy to the perfect case. But of course, you may now wonder, is it a good definition? 
I mean, it's a bit surprising definition. We have a classical style property that we define by a quantum game. Um, well, basically you can sh um, justify this by um, working with it and seeing how it works. And um, what we did is, at least we showed that it works well together with proofs that have rewinding. So we took um, an analysis of arguments of knowledge, which are proofs of knowledge that hold in the computational setting, um, something which inherently uses quantum rewinding, and, um, well, I can't go into details, but these commitments can be plugged in here and everything works nice. While prior results could only work, use perfectly binding commitments in the same situation. Um, it has nice properties, your know, definition works for multi-bit M without any difference. It composes in parallel, so if you com commit to several um, values, this is the same as committing to the concatenation of these values. Um, and we can also prove in the random oracle that this can be achieved. So if uh, H, well, is, well, if the, the hash function H we use here is a random oracle, we can prove that this can be satisfied. So it's, it's, we know that this um, is not an impossible definition. And we have sketches for construction without random oracle. Um, and it's not only this construction, I you, several natural constructions work in the random oracle model. But it was not sufficient if the hash function is just collision resistant. We can also show that. What are the open problems? There are three kind of big natural problems. The first is how do all these commitment definitions relate to each other? For most of them, like the one here and all the others that I cited but didn't explain, we don't really know whether they are actually different or not, and which implies which, and so on. Well, there could be a lot of research. Um, construction without random oracles, I guess that could be solvable, but perhaps there are better constructions. Um, and let's see where else this definition would be useful. So one interesting one, which I personally didn't manage, was to show the BBCS91 protocol, which makes an OT from commitment, um, to show that to be secure with this definition, I didn't manage. But perhaps it works, I don't know. That's it, thank you. Thank you, we have time for questions. Okay, um, thanks for a very nice talk. Um, I have a question. Quite often it is the case that um, a dishonest committer doesn't actually produce a, a message. Um, so in the sense, it's not, it's not kind of well defined what the M is. Yes. And can you deal with that in your? That's actually where the whole problem comes from. If it would be well defined, um, we could just do something like he cannot output the M that's not the right one. But the whole problem arises from the fact that it's not well defined. In the classical setting, we can get around it by saying we don't know what it is, but at least he can't find two of them. In the quantum setting, this doesn't work, so we need to have a, a different one, but the whole uh, different approach. But the whole definition never talks about the true M. I'm just saying the adversary should produce some superposition of many possible M's with corresponding information, but I'm not talking about which is in here. This is totally operational. The adversary produces some superposition of M's. Could be... Why does he have to produce something? I mean, if I uh, give you a... He doesn't have... Well, that's the game he has to play. And if he can't win in that game, it's, we call it uh, binding. Okay, thanks. Yeah. It's not... I'm not saying this is like the correct M's or something like this. He could do whatever he wants, actually. If you take A and B to be unbounded, do you get a definition which is the same as in the information theoretic one or something different? Yeah, if, if I take uh, A and B unbounded and uh, remove the plus negligible, then I'm actually uh, here, so that's perfect. Not in the perfect case with, with, um, with the bias. Do you get the bias? Is it the average? Well, since I'm talking about non-interactive commitments here, 
uh, there wouldn't be a difference. I haven't analyzed, I mean, I haven't studied this definition, I have written down the definition for interactive commit phase, but I have not analyzed it. So I'm not, I don't know whether there will be differences or not. It will be some kind of information theoretical definition, but um, it's hard to say, is it the right, uh, the one, because we don't have one. I mean, for the non-perfect case, we, the same problems occur as in the uh, computational setting, which is, what is the right definition? In which way do we weaken them? Do they work with rewinding, etc.? So I think there's no canonical definition there either. Okay, there are no more questions. Let's thank Dominique and all the speakers of the session again. Thank you. Thank you.